I'm James. I'm kicking off our sustainable mini uh, meetup today. Uh, I'm the organizer of uh, Sustainable UX, along with uh, my co-organizer, Jen Brazelli, who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, we ran a conference on, on this is issue uh, earlier in the year, and this is the continuance of that. Uh, let me just make sure this is going out correctly. Fantastic. So um, I saw some familiar names on our guest list, so thank you very much for coming back for more. Uh, for everyone else, a little bit of background about Sustainable UX, the conference, and, and the, the general idea. Um, it kind of started for me uh, very late last year. Uh, me and my friend Jen were discussing a common frustration that we had. We're, we're both very concerned about climate change, uh, but in our day jobs as digital designers, we very rarely get the chance to make a positive environmental impact. We're, we're working in bits and bytes and, and wireframes and, and so on. So uh, unless we actually get a project that's directly related to uh, some aspect of uh, uh, in, uh, environmentalism, uh, we don't get to uh, do much within our day job. So we had an idea. Let's hold a short virtual conference to discuss the ways that folks who work on digital, like UX designers, web designers, visual designers, uh, and who also care about climate change, we could pull our ideas about what we can actually do. How can we leverage our collective skills and experience uh, into making a positive impact? And maybe in the process, we would get some ideas and empower ourselves to make more of a difference. So we put the call out on Twitter, and we got a very enthusiastic response, which ended up in us recruiting about 13 speakers. Uh, we had 13 talks and a full seven-hour program. Uh, we held our event in, in February. 600 people around the world tuned in from about 20 different countries, and 500 people or so have tuned in since then to watch the replay on YouTube. And people keep coming back to the YouTube. They keep discovering these talks. Uh, so yeah, we, we were pleasantly surprised we found uh, both people who are uh, interested in the topic enough to, to already have fully formed talks uh, to give about it, um, and a, a larger audience out there in the world. Uh, I think there are a lot of thwarted digital designers out there who, who really want to do something uh, more for the environment. So what was particularly interesting for me was the range of, sus uh, range of issues uh, or range of views we heard on sustainability. We had talks that ranged from kind of what I see as nuts and bolts issues like how to reduce carbon in ICT and web hosting and web design, to more process-driven uh, talks, how, about how to work together in a, a greener fashion, how to green our processes. But we also talked some of the good UX behavior change uh, talk, how we can design to nudge consumers into greener behavior, and even how to change attitudes. How can we influence people uh, who deny climate change, which is a real problem here in America, where you know, a large proportion of the population uh, won't accept that there's anything going on. How can we influence people into making better choices or, or to open their eyes? And we had, a, we had some talks on inclusivity and justice, uh, which was completely awesome. It, it really taught me uh, that you can't really have a sustainability movement unless we're bringing everyone along. How can we include everybody uh, in this great project? So anyway, all those talks uh, are on YouTube. Uh, follow us on uh, Twitter. Um, you'll see the link on there. Uh, or just go to Google and, and uh, uh, search for uh, YouTube Sustainable UX, and you'll find all 13 of those talks there. So we wanted to keep the conversation going through the year, and that's why we're having some smaller events like this one. Uh, again, online only to keep the carbon footprint down, and open to everyone everywhere. Uh, I can see we've got a global audience again today, and of course, free, low carbon as we can. Now, I've really got to give all kudos here to my co-organizer for this event, Jen Schlick, uh, for really making this happen. She missed that first conference, and uh, she's been badgering me ever since for a follow-up. So with only a little bit of gentle arm twisting, here we are today. Uh, so thank you, Jen, for, for really making this happen. Today we're going to hear four short talks uh, from René Post, Irene Monatos, and uh, Frédéric Bordage, uh, and uh, Jen Schlick herself. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Jen now uh, to introduce our first speaker. Jen? Hi, everyone. So I am here to introduce Renee Bradage and Renee. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just confused your two last names. Um, it is still a little early in the morning, apparently. Um, this is Renee Post. And Renee Post is the founder of the Green Web Foundation. Um, the Green Web Foundation is a nonprofit that develops tools to enable the transition towards the use of renewable energy by hosting providers and data centers. Um, the Green Web Foundation has created a really cool Chrome add-on for checking a website's sustainability. Um, they also have an API for rating hosting providers. 
which is used by tools like EcoGrader, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and Renee is here to talk about media streaming. So I'm going to hand it off to Renee. Renee? Yeah, all right. Thank you, Jen. Uh, is sound okay? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm sitting in Sweden, so it's a uh, late afternoon here. But let's not talk about that. Um, uh, as said, I want to tell a few things about uh, streaming and, uh, yeah, to, to make it sound a bit edgy, I want to say the, the environmental nightmare called streaming. Uh, in 2017, uh, 2015, excuse me, 70% of all data traffic was streaming, 7-0. And in 2020, it will be 82%. Uh, this, is, uh, this comes from a Cisco white paper. Uh, if anyone wants the link, I can send it, of course. Uh, global mo mobile data traffic will grow three times as fast as fixed IP tra traffic uh, in the next five years. It was 5% and it will be 16%. Uh, traffic of PCs grows 8%, smartphones 58% per year. Uh, it sounds a bit boring, but uh, I want to, to paint a picture. Uh, global data traffic will increase threefold between 2015 and 2020 and will have increased a hundredfold between 2005 and 2020. Uh, this is interesting because I started with the predecessor of the Green Bay Foundation in 2005, and in 2006, for the first time, the number popped up like the, the, um, uh, the, the carbon footprint of the internet is comparable to that of the aviation industry, and is around 3% of the global carbon footprint. It's completely unclear where this number comes from, but it has been copied and recycled uh, an unlimited number of times in the last 10 years. Nobody knows where it comes from. And what is much more amazing that it's so steady, that it stays at 3%. Nobody knows why. Um, the thing is that if in 2006 already the, the internet was responsible, responsible for 3% of, of the carbon uh, footprint, uh, where does that bring this, us in 2020 when the data traffic will be 100-fold, will have grow, grown 100-fold compared to 2005? Um, there's, of course, it won't be 300%. It's quite impossible. So you have to... Uh, understand that data traffic is only part of the equation, of course. So if you think about a server farm, if the server farm uh, uh, yeah, creates more data traffic, then uh, of course that does cost a bit more energy, but it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like double data traffic is double energy. Um, to dive into this, you can look at uh, clicking green uh, report clicking clean report of Greenpeace in the 2015 version. They break down the power consumptions of consumption of networks and data centers. And in 2012, uh, that was a total of 35% of the total internet power consumption. And this is growing in 2017 to 60%. So you see that the, the growth in data traffic does actually uh, lead to uh, much more energy consumption of the internet. Um, but, uh, and it shows that the data traffic, especially video streams, are a major driver of the energy consumption of the internet. Um, all right, this was the first part then, then this of what I wanted to tell. Then the second part is a little bit more about broadcasting in general. Uh, if you think about how a radio works, it transmits information, and the factual number of listeners has no impact on the energy consumption of the radio station itself. So, in the middle of the night, nobody's listening. The, the transmitter uses the same kind of energy as with a million people listening to a football match, as happened here yesterday in Sweden. Um, the internet is, however decentralized, basically used as a narrow casting infrastructure. Almost all traffic is between servers and clients. But these are not so much the demands of the network, but this is due to how companies work. 
they want to keep control over their content most of all. So if you listen to a song 10 times, they much rather stream it 10 times than let you store it locally so you can listen without being connected to the network. Uh, Spotify is actually one of the few companies that defies this logic and actually uses peer-to-peer -peer storage and traffic, not to save energy in the first place, but to able to deliver music streams much faster. Can they still monitor who's listening to what? Of course they can, no problems there. So you see that it's, uh, yeah, that is not so much what I said, not so much the demands of the network, but more nobody cares. It is easy to do, it is cheap. And um, the real costs are often uh, absorbed, absorbed much further down the chain. Uh, another added benefit of peer-to-peer -peer connections is, is that they favor proximity, thereby minimizing traveling distances and thus the number of stations in between. Other companies could easily follow this example, but it's too cheap to keep wasting energy. Um, why is it important to... Um, to minimize traveling distance, well, if you think that today 70% of global internet traffic passes through the dullest technology corridor, I found out, it's uh, based in Northern Virginia, I think, um, and that is the, the main internet traffic port, 70%. Um, so it becomes clear that efficiency and, de and decentralization has up till now never been on the short list of network planners. Um, I could go into that why it works that way, but I can only say that to, to keep this simple is that uh, the people communi uh, communicate with internet exchanges and once you're a member of an internet exchange, you can dump any amount of traffic there without actually paying for the traffic. So that is what's happening. And what the traffic does Further on, you don't know, you don't care. Uh, then the third part, because that will uh, interest uh, some of you, I think, the, the most. But what can we as normal people, as internet builders, do about this? Uh, well, I think the first step, and, and I hope to inspire some of you here, because I've come to realize that internet effectivity is is truly virgin territory. There's nobody thinking about this. If you start thinking about this, you, you soon see enormous gains that are lying there. Uh, and, and, much, uh, and, and companies have to profit from them, but nobody seems to be thinking that way. Um, and, well, I'm coming back to that later. To give a small example, if you listen to a radio stream with Firefox, in the tab you can turn the sound off, really, really handy. But when you do so, it is really easy to forget you turn it on in the first place. It happens to me daily when I listen to Dutch radio, because I'm Dutch, and then I turn off the advertisements, but then I forget to turn it on. But on the background, however, the stream just continues as if you are still listening. The radio station who makes money from selling advertisement does not care if you listen or not. Firefox, maintained by the Mozilla Foundation, just offers a handy tool and does not, does not care specifically about the energy consumption that follows out of the way the functionality is designed. Two simple ways this could be approached. Uh, a, get rid of the very convenient way to turn the sound on and off without actually opening a tab, or if the sound is turned off, stop the stream after several minutes. It, takes only a, around a second on my connection to start the stream anew. So that is an awful lot of energy loss to gain, to gain exactly one second um, of music. Another example, Facebook's decision to auto-start video as soon as you scroll past it has undoubtedly multiplied the data traffic. We can only guess, but it could be like a factor 10 or more. If you see all these people on their smartphones scrolling past things they do not want to see, it is a huge waste. Facebook could add an option to turn this off, but they will not do it since their advertisers will not like it. And it pumps up the involvement numbers, so people look much more involved than they actually are. Um, Facebook can use en green energy, but does, that does not prevent lots of users uh, of burning a lot of coal on local networks for things they don't actually do not want to watch. So the strength of the internet uh, traffic 
and that is traffic does not equal costs for most users, it's a weakness here. No one is responsible for or inclined to change something. And I have no idea how to solve this actually. A last simple tip about what you could do is if you include lengthy video streams on your website, is maybe you can cut them up in several smaller, smaller parts. This could prevent that someone forgets it and leaves it on while he or she is already doing something else. But I'm very curious about what your suggestions uh, are because I've been trying to paint a picture here about what's going on. And uh, I, well, I hope to inspire you to, to, to generate more leads about uh, this. Um, well, that was basically it. Thank you. Renee, thank you so much. I'm looking for the... Ah, there we go. <laughs> that was great. Um, and uh, and uh, and somebody as somebody who streams an awful lot too much video these days, uh, a bit of an eye opener for me personally. I'd, I'd certainly seen that. Um, uh, who is it? The uh, Sanders um, bandwidth report on on just the steady growth of video and uh, how much it's just dominating all the traffic. Um, so I think we've got a couple of minutes here for Q and A. So I want to invite uh, our other speakers. Uh, now, if they have uh, have questions, um, to have at it here in the open channel. I will also tune into the Q and A app that we have here, um, uh, going with the uh, the Hangout to see if any anyone has tuned in uh, to ask a question. Um, speakers, any any questions for Renee? Um, I have a question. Not related to streaming, but Renee, I know that um, you have an API as a part of the Green Web Foundation, and I, I think EcoGrader might use it. Um, I guess I'm curious about any new applications you might see for that um, for other developers or anyone kind of listening to this right now? He's gone. <laughs> Renee, you're, you're, on, you're on mute. You might not know. All right. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks for, sorry. Um, uh, thanks for your question, Jen. But mm, no, not, I don't know of any new, I don't have any ideas about it. But um, yeah, people are free to, to talk to the API. And yeah, I've been thinking like something, it would be, Interested to to include in some in stats uh, applications like PVIC, so you can see which of your visitors uh, uh, are green hosted or or which of the referral domains are green hosted, etc. Et that makes more sense. Or so things like that. But I don't know if it would make a lot of sense. But uh, but one thing I can say to to uh, as an add-on to what you told me is that the the browser add-ons they they work for all browsers. We have five browsers now, so it's not only Chrome, but uh, yeah, basically the most used uh, browsers, even Internet Explorer. So as we call it here. <laughs> oh, that's great! Thanks. All right, thanks. And uh, I encourage everybody to install those uh, add-ons. Um, when you can, we'll we'll post a link out to those. Um, uh, I uh, I find that stuff personally very interesting indeed. So so I had I had one uh, one sort of semi question or rambling observation, which is uh, the rise of VR and uh, distributed gaming. Uh, again, looking at these bandwidth reports, we see more and more streaming video being consumed, um, uh, particularly as you know the Netflix binge and so on, so that makes it very easy to, to consume three hours of TV or more or whatever the, the American average is. Um, mm -hmm. But now we're seeing this new this new paradigm coming up, which is uh, uh, the VR, uh, which has huge video demands. You know, the, the more high res uh, the demand, um, uh, the greater the bandwidth, and we're starting to see streaming solutions for that. So uh, not, really, not really a question, but, but certainly on my radar is... You know, as as we get even more into high bandwidth immersive experiences, then we're going to have 
you know, uh, a, a new dimension to that problem. I know gaming already is, a, and you know, just Xbox One and PS Network and so on, are a, a steadily growing component of our bandwidth too. Uh, so something to think about. True. There, there, there are some, there is data about uh, VR as well, and they estimate that in 2020, uh, it will 30 percent of the data traffic will be VR related. So that is a huge growth. Ah, so as a designer, um, in, in the web design portion of these talks, I, I normally talk about ah, how, we, how we can design more lo-fi as a way of uh, reducing mm -hmm. bandwidth. So I encourage anybody who's working on VR to embrace the Tron aesthetic. You know, very, very wireframe. Uh, don't, don't go for the high-res immersive environments. Go for, go for more abstract shapes and, uh, <laughs> and colors, and that will reduce bandwidth. Um, okay, uh, so any any last question here? Otherwise, uh, it is time to move on to our next speaker. All right. Okay, so it uh, gives me a lot of pleasure here to uh, well, first of all, thank you again, Renee. That was uh, that was awesome. Um, yeah. I'm going to rewatch that talk. There's there's a lot of facts and figures in there, but we can rewatch that on YouTube um, to to uh, recapture that. Uh, but now. Brings me great pleasure to introduce uh, my co-host and second speaker of the day, uh, Jen Schlick. Jen is the web manager at the uh, Massachusetts uh, Technology Energy Initiative. Uh, she works closely with their communications team, managing web projects and web education efforts. She has a decade of experience working in web technologies, including WordPress. Jen is passionate about CSS, responsive design, and solving complex front-end problems. And her talk today will be about low-carbon web design. Jen, over to you. All right, thanks, James. Um, I am going to share my screen. So give me just a moment to get that up. OK, is this, uh, is this live? Yes. Cool. OK. So um, interrupt me if um, this cuts out at any point, but I'm going to assume my screen sharing is working. OK, so um, hey, everyone. My name is Jen, um, as James said, and I'm here from the MIT Energy Initiative. Um, I'm also at Jen Schlick on Twitter. Um, and today I'm going to basically give a short and sweet version of a 40-minute talk that I gave this past April um, in Helsinki at a conference called WordCamp. And what I'm going to talk about is low-carbon web design. So low-carbon web design is minimizing a website's carbon footprint by choosing online services that are powered by renewable energy. Um, so I'm going to tell you why, for most of us, this comes down to one burning question. But before we get to that, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about why. That is why we would want to minimize the carbon footprint of our websites to begin with. Um, so to start, the carbon footprint of the internet is enormous. About half of the world's population, 3.3 billion people, are online. And put together, we all produce about 300 million tons of CO2 per year. If the internet were a country, it would be the sixth largest in electricity use, behind China, the US, India, Japan, and Russia. So those are some pretty big numbers. Uh, to put it in perspective, a single tweet emits 0.02 grams of CO2. Sending an email emits 4 grams. A Google search emits 7 grams. That means two Google searches emits about the same amount of energy as bringing a kettle to a boil. So in our day-to-day -day lives, I find that the internet really feels infinite. Our data goes into a place we call the cloud, right? Just the term the cloud, um, to me, suggests a place that is somehow apart from everything that happens down here. But the cloud has a carbon footprint. And there is a place where, as I like to say, where the cloud touches the ground. Um, and that place is the data center, the data center where my website, your website, our apps, our resources are hosted. Um, data centers are constantly spinning, constantly working, and they need a constant flow of electricity for our work to be possible. Um, whether that electricity comes from conventional fuel like oil or gas, or renewable energy like wind or solar, that is the most important question you can ask yourself. 
So that one question I mentioned earlier, that's, that's it. <laughs> Low carbon web design really comes down to the question of, is my data center powered by renewable energy? And the good news is some of the biggest tech companies are thinking about this. Um, this chart comes from Greenpeace's 2015 Click Clean report. Greenpeace puts out this report every year. It's super, super interesting. Um, the companies on the green end of this chart get their electricity from renewable energy sources, and the companies on the black end get their energy from fossil fuels like oil and gas. And so what's really interesting about this is that the utility companies that supply the electricity for each of these circles, right, each of these companies, is one of the biggest obstacles to reducing the Internet's carbon footprint. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by that. So the utilities are often controlled by monopoly companies that use oil and gas, um, and the data centers are essentially locked in. They can't switch to renewable energy until the utility companies do. Um, any of us trying to convince our utility company to change their energy source are not likely to have much success, but the big tech companies, the big circles on this chart, have an economic influence that's super persuasive. Apple, Facebook, and Google are particularly notable for making these commitments to move to renewable energy. And those, uh, those commitments are proving actually successful in driving the utility companies to change. So I'll give you an example. Um, last year, Apple announced that they were going to build a new data center in Arizona. The local utility company didn't offer any renewable energy options, but Apple had already made this company-wide commitment to move to 100% renewable energy powered facilities. And the utility company wanted Apple in that town so badly that they agreed to develop new solar plants just to make the data center possible. So that's how technology companies are really bringing change to areas that are locked into fossil fuels. Um, and another example, Google built a data center in Hamina in Finland. Um, it uses seawater for its water cooling system and local generated wind power. And Google has definitely been a pioneer in this space um, in terms of setting a good example and doing it really far back. About 37% of their data centers are powered by renewable energy right now, and they make up for the remaining 63% by buying carbon offsets. And because of those two things, Google has been able to say that they are carbon neutral since 2007, um, which is great. So, but one point I want to make kind of about that, and when asking yourself this question about, is my data center powered by renewable energy, you should know that carbon offsets are good, but renewable energy is better. Um, and Google using carbon offsets is great. Finding a data center that runs on renewable energy is always going to be a little bit better. Um, so where do we start? We start by really moving to a data center um, powered by renewable energy. And that means looking at the main server or servers we use to serve our websites or apps, as well as the third-party services we use. Um, in other industries, this is called your supply chain. And it's the stuff you use to make your products. For those of us who build websites for other people, which is a lot of us, um, often those people are accountable for things like sustainability audits or B Corp certifications or other metrics where they need to account for their supply chain. And we are a part of that supply chain. By using services powered by renewable energy and recommending them, we actually become more appealing for people to want to work with us. So. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about some tools, because um, I love tools, we love tools, tools are awesome. And a lot of us use Google PageSpeed. Um, with Google PageSpeed, you put in your website's URL, and Google will tell you how to make your website faster. It's, it's great. And it turns out there is a tool like Google PageSpeed for looking at your website's carbon footprint, and it's called EcoGrader. Um, EcoGrader is pretty great if you're starting out on this journey. It's maintained by a firm called Mighty Bytes, and with this tool, you give it your website's URL, and it will tell you how to make your website more energy efficient. And I asked Mighty Bytes if they had any interesting data on who's using this tool, and it turns out that over the past three years, they've crawled about 70,000 URLs, and only about 2% are powered by renewable energy, um, which is a pretty small number. Um, another recommendation I want to make, not a tool, but just a cool resource, is a book coming out later this year called Designing for Sustainability. 
And um, I'm particularly interested in Chapter 7 called Calculating the Carbon Footprint of a Website. That looks pretty promising, I think. It's out in early release now, so um, you can go check it out at um, O'Reilly.com, which I think is the publisher, and, um, and check it out. So I want to wrap up with uh, one last kind of big picture note, um, and that is that last December, representatives from 195 countries convened in Paris for what's called the Conference of the Parties, um, or COP21. So these 195 countries agreed on a goal to set global warming, to limit global warming to less than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And um, this was a landmark agreement. But one of the biggest influences on climate change was, wasn't there. It had no name and it had no representative. And it was, it was us, right? It was the internet. It was that sixth largest country in electricity use. Um, and we're growing, and we have no representative. And things like this, things like COP21, really bring that to the forefront, I think. And um, so I think now is really the time to start thinking about this. And it really starts with asking questions like, is my data center powered by renewable energy? And, um, and kind of going from there. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Thanks. Super. I can't wait to see the uh, the full length version of that. Am I right in thinking that that you've got a full length version of that talk online somewhere? Yeah, I I gave it at WordCamp. Um, so it's up on WordCamp.tv. I think is the URL, and um, you could search for my name or probably low carbon web design, and it's up there. Great. Well, uh, I encourage folks to to do that and get the get the full get the full talk. Uh, so thank you again. So uh, again, we've got a couple of minutes here um, uh, with time for questions. Uh, so I'll open that up to uh, the rest of our speakers and uh, folks watching along at home. You can use the uh, chat tool uh, here in the Google Hangout um, and uh, let fly for any questions for Jen. Uh, so let's just give that a moment there. Um, so I have a question uh, while we wait and see if anyone else has any, which is around carbon offsets. So you're saying carbon offsets good, you know, obviously renewable energy and energy reduction uh, better uh, than, than offsets. Um, and, that, and that's definitely something I've heard as well. Um, what, one thing I keep hearing about carbon offsets is it's very hard to get a true carbon offset which is really reducing carbon um, out of the atmosphere, a, a lot of offsets are, are kind of developmental-minded or, or of dubious value and so on. So I was wondering, how, how much have you looked at carbon offsets and do you have a, a recommended uh, supplier that you can tell people to use? I So I myself have not looked into them as much as I probably should, um, other than knowing basically how they work and the kind of the downsides of them. Um, one place to buy them, though, that I'm aware of and have heard recommendations for is TerraPass, T-E-R-R-A, Pass. Um, but um, I, I, think, I think it's a little bit of a contentious issue and one that people should probably research and figure out if it makes sense for them, um, mm -hmm. like in their organization, because there are so many different ways it can sway, so many different ways you can invest in the carbon offsets. It's not quite just as simple as buying a credit and Wiping our hands and being done with it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, TerraPass. Okay, I'm going to check those out. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we've got a question here. Um, oh, apparently it was a button I can press which promotes this question. So, uh, Ralph Cutler uh, has uh, joined us to ask uh, We are a web agency and we use uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, anyone coming close to being an alternative? So, uh, the, the, I guess the intent of this question is uh, the Greenpeace Clicking Green report usually calls out Amazon Web Services as being one of the most, if not the most, polluting uh, web host out there. They use a, uh, they, they don't use much renewables in their energy mix. Um, I believe they, they have said things in, in the last uh, letter from Jeff Bezos saying, oh, we're going to invest more in renewable energy. Um, but as of right now, they're still uh, kind of a crappy, <laughs> crappy, um, uh, thing, but they're ubiquitous, you know, uh, EC2, uh, AWS, the other services are, are almost indispensable, and so many things are, 
are built on top of those. But I just found that my own web host is basically just a reseller for AWS, so I was mm. uh, uh, not pleased about that. Uh, so not to hijack the question, the question is, if you're an AWS user, any ideas on how to migrate off that? And anybody offering comparable services at a comparable price? Yeah, man, that's a huge question. Um, my mind goes to Google Cloud Platform, um, just knowing that it's something Google is actively doing is moving to renewables and buying offsets. So using a Google product for me would be a step in the right direction and in that sense. I mean, however you feel about using Google is kind of another question. But mm -hmm. um, using their cloud platform, I think, is a step towards at least a company that's using renewables. Um, I'm sure there are other alternatives out there that I'm not aware of, but um, I think that would be an interesting one to hear from other people after the after the meetup on Twitter and stuff. That's definitely an interesting question when you when you're dealing with things like um, uh, content delivery networks. If you if you do have a global audience, yeah. then. It's like, okay, it's fine to host part of your web presence in Iceland and, and get the nice geothermal energy powering your servers, but you know, if you're trying to be green or use renewable energy on a global basis, then yeah, then you have a problem <laughs> trying to trying to. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if any CDN advertises itself as all green because of course then it needs each local power supply to be uh, green as well. So so that's that's something I don't know anything about, but uh, uh, I'm keen to find out more about. Um, but as a, as a general tip for people, it's like I, I would I would say like the, the order of concerns is reduce the amount of data, um, host on renewable, and then uh, offset the rest. So uh, you know we can't control all the energy that is used uh, between you know server and user and so on, but uh, we can at least reduce the amount of data that that we're sending. Um, okay, any any more questions before uh, we move on to our third speaker? I'm not seeing any more. Okay, Jen, thank you again. That was fantastic. Um, so I'm now going to introduce uh, our uh, third speaker of today, uh, Irene. Irene uh, Manitas is a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware, where she is investigating and designing approaches to help software developers write more energy efficient software applications. She has participated in several empirical studies that show how developers' decisions impact the energy usage of applications. And she's currently working on a framework that aims to optimize the energy usage in Java applications. Irene, over to you. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, meetup. Um, this time, I would like to talk about a paper that we presented this uh, last May in the International Conference of Software Engineering. Um, so I will talk, I will share my screen so that you can see uh, the slides of the presentations. And you know, if you have any questions, that, uh, I will be happy to take them uh, at the end. I will try to do this uh, like a, a abbreviated version of uh, the presentation that I did in the conference. Um, OK, so let me start here. And So I hope you can see it right now. Can someone confirm? Yep, we're all good. Great. So um, in this paper, I'm going to talk about an empirical study that we did on practitioners' perspectives on green software engineering. This was a collaborative work that we did with uh, some companies like Microsoft, IBM Research, IBB, and Google. Um, so what was the motivation of this? Well, um, there is an increase in the concerns about the amount of energy that especially smartphones and data centers consume. Uh, we have seen here, like some of you that have talked about the uh, energy consumption of uh, data centers and you know that's something that we are aware of so we were wondering if we as a research community in the software engineering area we are targeted, targeting problems that are important to practitioners that you know are working on these 
applications and if they are worrying about you know these energy concerns. So we did this empirical study and then we wanted to know how they think about these energy uh, concerns during the software development phases. So we started by uh, we using this methodology by starting uh, conducting some interviews uh, with 18 participants at Microsoft. We then uh, transcribe the interviews, use a professional transcript service to get the data from um, these sessions that we have. Then we code this information and we analyze the data that we had by using uh, um, some selective codes that allow us to identify what were the more important topics that were uh, discussed during these interview sessions. And then we, uh, from this uh, process, we were able to identify what were the more important uh, topics that we'll talk about these interviews. With this information, we created like a survey uh, that targeted uh, some of the most important um, discussions that we have, and then we distribute this survey uh, to all the companies that we collaborated with, uh, Google, ABV, uh, Microsoft, and um, yes, yeah, so all the companies that we collaborated. And then with this data, we were able to identify what uh, practitioners think about energy during the different phases of the development process, and then we, I'm going to show you what were the, uh, you know, results from this uh, study, and then what were the implications that we found from this study. So let me skip this uh, information about the service and the interviews. Our first research question was: In what domains is energy use as a concern? for these practitioners. So this table that I'm going to show up show the responses that we grew by the respondents more closely related project. So these are the responses that we ask practitioners if their applications have requirement about energy usage. So the first um, uh, result that you see for all shows the responses from all the participants of for our surveys. And what we can see on the left is the percentage of the respondents that were related with never or rarely. On the center, we can see the percentage that is related with the sometimes response. And then on the right hand of uh, the figure, we can see the percentages that are related with the often and almost always. So what we can see from here is that, for example, in the first stack bar, we can see that for uh, in overall, 62% of the respondents says that they never never or rarely have requirements related with energy. 50% uh, of respondents said they sometimes have this kind of requirements, and then often or almost always uh, all the respondents say that they have this kind of requirements. What we can get from these uh, results overall we can see that the subsequent um, stack bar shows the, res the respondents groups, mobile, traditional, embedded, and data center groups. And we can see from here that the embedded and data center groups are the ones that are, you know, um, they have uh, the less percentage of uh, requirements that are related with energy usage, right? And we can see here also that the mobile group is the one that cares more about these kind of uh, energy requirements, which was surprising for us because we were expecting, you know, that data center, the data center groups were more concerned about these kind of requirements. So what we analyzed from these results was that during our interviews, uh, there were a lot of people that said that they care about energy, but on the hardware level, but then on the software uh, level, uh, there is people that they are not uh, too much concerned about these things, and that's because, you know, they they um, they are not um, relating the cost of the services that they provide with the energy consumption. So that's why they, there is now this, uh, you know, importance at this level. Then our second question was. What are experienced practitioners' perspectives uh, regarding um, energy consumption on the different phases of the software development process? So the group by Siobook is uh, the Siobook is a book that is used in software engineer that is um, related with guidelines about 
you know, how to develop software. And then it describes like the different phases that we have, like uh, requirement solicitation, like uh, collecting what the, the um, stakeholders want for the applications, like the features, and then you know developing or constructing the application, or coding the application, and then testing the application, and then you know uh, how to maintain the application. So for this um, research question, we consider respondents whose projects sometimes, often, or almost always have energy users. Requirements are goals because we were interested in knowing the perspectives of the practitioners that, you know, have this kind of uh, concerns in their uh, applications. So the first, um, in the first uh, phase of the development is, is related with the requirements. So we wanted to know what do typical energy usage requirements look like. Uh, from this study, we, we discovered that these requirements are often desires rather than a specific target, so there is not a specific goal for energy usage. Just don't be bad. Uh, these requirements are often stated in terms of other than energy usage, like I consider running time and that seems to suggest battery lives, so they relate some of the other uh, features of the applications with energy, and then some of these requirements focus on idle time. So actually one of the practitioners says, I haven't thought about that actually when the application is in the foreground, and we are trying to still save battery. So they are focusing the energy uh, efficiency optimizations when the application is in, in the background. Then we wanted to know how often do practitioners make this kind of trade-off between other features of their applications and energy users of their applications. This figure is showing the responses of the, of the participants when we ask them if they are willing to sacrifice performance, usability, etc., for reducing the energy consumption of their applications. And what we can see from here is that, you know, um, the 40% of the, of the respondents says sometimes they're willing to do these sacrifices, and then 33% of the uh, participants say they often or almost always are willing to do these kind of sacrifices for energy consumption. So overall, they are willing to sacrifice other features of the application for reducing the energy consumption. So these are the, you know, the takeaway messages from the, this phase of the development in terms of the requirements and then uh, how they are willing to sacrifice other features for energy. Uh, there are some open challenges that we as a community uh, need to address, like techniques to understand and describe this energy usage for a task, like what is that reasonable energy consumption, consumption for a specific uh, task in an application, and then identifying how changes in the energy impact other quality requirements of applications so that developers can make really a trade-off and, you know, make wise decisions about this kind of um, features in their applications. Then we wanted to know about the design phase in the development process. So how do energy concerns impact different aspects of the design process? So this figure shows the responses of the participants when we ask them if energy uses concerns impact the design of individual classes that are from their applications, individual modules, the interactions between the different modules and classes, or the entire application. And what we can see from the results is that you know, high-level designs, so such interactions and the entire applications are the ones that are most often impacted by these energy concerns uh, for them. Then we wanted to know which contexts are considered when they are assessing the energy usage of their applications. So we asked them when they evaluate the energy usage, if they consider, you know, the usage scenarios of their applications, the applications environment, uh, the underlying hardware or other applications that are running. And what we can see from these results uh, is that m what mostly um, practitioners know if they believe there exist techniques that lead or poor energy usage, if they are aware of these techniques. 
So these figures show the response of practitioners when we ask them if there are general techniques that lead to good or poor energy usage. And what we can see from here is that the majority of uh, the responses uh, show us that the majority of practitioners believe these uh, techniques exist and then uh, uh, probably that means that they will um, they will use it or they are using it in this uh, moment for these applications. Then this is, these are the takeaway methods for the design phase uh, in regards with the designs that they are using and the um, considerations that they are having when assessing the energy consumption and then the open challenges for our communities, you know, uh, developing a scenario aware tools that help practitioners during the application design so they, they know what are the energy impacts of uh, these scenarios and then what are the trade-offs between these um, um, other free application features and the energy consumption. And also more studies that evaluate the practitioner's belief according to what is good and bad for energy consumption and then that help them to support the decision making when they are trying to select these um, methodologies or approaches to improve the energy consumption of their applications. Then we analyze what were the perspectives during the construction phase. So we wanted to know if practitioners believe they have accurate intuitions about energy usage of their code. So this figure is showing the responses when we ask them if they have accurate intuitions about the energy consumption of their code. And as we can see from here, the majority of uh, respondents says they are undecided. 51% of the respondents they say they are undecided and 19% of the respondents that they have, they strongly disagree or disagree. So as one practitioner said, they care about memory usage, CPU usage, because they understand those, but they don't have the same intuition about energy. So this is a point where we have to, you know, work more towards uh, helping developers to understand what is the energy consumption of their code. Then we wanted to know how will practitioners like to learn about improving the energy consumption. So this figure shows the results when we ask them if they could learn how to improve the energy usage by, you know, using tools, take, talking to other people looking at other code or reading the documentation. So what we can see from here is that you know, overall practitioners are eager to learn in many different ways. So we as a community need to you know, work in these different ways to help developers um, start working uh, on these uh, specific strategies to improve the energy consumption of their code. So these are the uh, takeaways from the construction phase and some of the open challenges uh, regarding this phase of the development process are, you know, creating main paradigms for delaying the computation as, uh, as well as, you know, creating tools that automatically transform the energy consumption of applications so that we can help developers in, in this um, energy efficiency uh, process for the applications provide them fine-grained profiling tools for them so that they can, you know, analyze um, the energy consumption of their code and also analyze the whole system and see how the interactions between their application and other applications affect this energy consumption and also implementing and, you know, providing education mechanisms that let them know more about how to improve the energy efficiency. We investigated like the perspectives on finding the industry, uh, and then I will leave you. I think the the, <laughs> the time is up. So uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I was just 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 popping up to say uh, we're we're out of time. So uh, if if we can wrap this one up okay. here, then, then we'll leave some uh, right. space for our so, last speaker. Sure. So you know you can read more on the paper, and I am happy to take. Um, any questions that you have about this study? And um, yeah, that's that's all. I will stop. Sure. Great. Thank you, Irene. That was absolutely fascinating, and, I, and I'm, I'm definitely going to go check out that paper myself. Um, just just in the interest of uh, of time, since we have one more speaker, I'm going to say uh, if anyone has questions, 
uh, for Irene to take it into the chat channel. Um, if you're on the Google Hangout, there should be a chat option, uh, and you can carry on with Q&A there. Um, otherwise, for now, just just to uh, we're, we're going to shoot past 11, probably to about uh, 10 past 11 or so. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jen, who's going to introduce our last speaker of the day. Thank you again, Irene. Over to Jen. Great. Yeah, thanks, Irene. That was fantastic. So we're going to go straight over to Fred. So Frédéric Bordage is the author of the French book, Effective Green Web Design, Principles and the Best Practices. It is a guide for web designers and developers to learn about sustainable best practices. The book is currently being translated into English. Um, and Frederick is going to talk about sustainability best practices covered in the book. Over to you, Fred. OK. Well, hi, everybody. That's just uh, a few seconds for human beings. You know, we are young human beings, so it's cool to say hello. And I switch off my camera to, uh, to save the bandwidth. So I turn it off. So. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, as uh, Jen said, uh, I'm, I work in this uh, area for uh, several years. So uh, I've been working on green IT. Uh, I began in 2004 and uh, in web eco design, uh, which is directly related to sustainable uh, UX. Uh, I think I began in 2009. Uh, so the last seven years, I've been working on dozens of projects. Uh, from top 10 French websites to uh, critical enterprise grade uh, bank software. And um, a few years ago, uh, in 2010, I was uh, wondering how to, uh, to share all the best practices I've learned on, on the field uh, with others. And so uh, with two other guys, we decided to write a book. Uh, 12 people uh, eco-designed their website. So uh, I will just switch for a few seconds the camera to uh, show you the book, real life. Um, so here is the book. That's a very small book. And that's it. And um, and uh, in this book, we, uh, we are sharing best practices with uh, web designers, web developers, and everybody who is uh, working on a web project. But just uh, before uh, presenting the book and what we put in it, um, I want to share my vision of what is web eco-design with you, because I heard a lot about, uh, a lot about uh, energy, but nothing about uh, abiotic resource depletion or all uh, the other type of uh, impact, environmental impacts. And as I'm doing lots of life cycle analysis on a everyday basis, um, uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of type of impacts uh, related to the web. And uh, for me, sustainable UX and web eco design is uh, really much wider than just uh, uh, working on saving energy. That's really great to save energy, but we have. Uh, uh, other challenges to, uh, to to work on. So, in our uh, uh, sorry, uh, what we try to reduce by eco-designing website and online services is uh, the uh, an entire environmental footprint and not only uh, energy but also uh, abiotic resource depletion, uh, fighting. Uh, um, the uh, biodiversity collapse and so on. And so, when you look where are uh, where those impacts occurred, when you do an, a life cycle analysis, it is very clear that the main problem is when we are building all the devices that make the web. In fact, so that's uh, uh, every uh, connected object, but also every laptop, every smartphone, and so on. And so, if you want to reduce the overall environmental web footprint, you have to work in reducing uh, the number of physical uh, devices, so that servers, but also bandwidths, and also uh, all the memory you need on your laptop to uh, to execute a website. And you have also in in um, you have also to fight that the second uh, the second point, sorry the second point, 
you have to fight against plain obsolescence because we renew our um, laptops, smartphones, and so on very uh, too uh, too fast. So uh, you have to enlarge their lifespan to uh, decrease the uh, overall uh, internet environmental footprint. So uh, we're wor working on best practices that are targeting all those impacts and not. Uh, only energy, but also all those impacts like abiotic resource depletion and so on, and that's what we put in the um, in the book. So the first edition of the book was uh, published in uh, 2011, and uh, we sold around uh, four to six thousand uh, copies. Uh, so that's a lot for France, you know, and a bit Switzerland, a bit Belgium. And so for a few years, people were uh, uh, were implementing all those best practices. And in 2005, we released the second edition of the book. So at the beginning, the book was a, a book uh, written by three guys. And the second edition has been written by four, more than four organizations. So that's something like... Uh, uh, standard repository of uh, web eco design best practices, and so in this in this book we are uh, uh, we are giving advice for all uh, people working on web projects. So that's come from UX to you to to user interface to uh, uh, architecture hosting and everybody who is uh, who is uh, who is working on a web project. So we are targeting every every people, and we are giving them f between five to uh, fifteen best practices, and um, they can uh, very simple uh, pra uh, best practices they they can uh, use on an everyday uh, on an everyday uh, sorry sorry everyday life basis. I, I will show you just some samples. So I share again my uh, my screen and. I'm going to, okay, so that's really simple and uh, sounds like obvious, it, it, it may sound obvious for you, so that's uh, very simple best practices from uh, improve the process flow to uh, remove non-essential non features to uh, very uh, performance related best practices like I don't know if you see the best practices because it's lagging on my laptop. To to uh, very uh, related performance related best best practices like uh, compress uh, HTML, uh, minify uh, JS and CS, uh, CSS, sorry, and so on. Okay. So I switch back without the uh, the screen uh, the screen share. So that's how we try we are trying to help uh, people reduce the, their website environmental footprint. So that's very uh, simple and sounds like very obvious best practices. And uh, till now we had all those best practices best practices in French, and we just finished to translate them into English. So we are in a process to share. Uh, those best practices with the community and we don't know yet how we'll do that. We have two options. The first is to publish a new book, an English book, so the English version of the French book and the other option is to share them uh, in, uh, into like a checklist with a Creative Commons uh, license and we, are, we don't know yet uh, what we will do and we are uh, we are asking the community to to help us choose uh, what to do, because uh, we want to build this uh, English uh, repository project with the community. So that's the first tool. In this book, we also have uh, an assessment uh, methodology that help everybody evaluate the uh, eco design maturity of his website. So we are uh, counting. That's a, a bit like the, um, the eco grader. So we are counting every uh, best practices that has been implemented, and if you have enough best practices implemented, then uh, you uh, uh, you get the uh, bronze grade or uh, silver grade and so on. 
And we, uh, here in France, the community also have uh, built a, a third tool that is uh, called the uh, Echo Index. Uh, and that, um, that tool evaluates the environmental footprint, but also the environmental performance of an URL. So it helps you understand how many greenhouse gases, how many water you have in your web page. So I don't know if I have enough time. No, I won't have enough time. So, so uh, I will send you the uh, the web address uh, that to help you uh, play with it and uh, uh, discover it. We are we have some other projects in the pipes here in France. The first one is certification. We have uh, nearly finished to build a, a certification to assess people knowledge. So to be sure that when uh, people have been trained about uh, sustainable UX and web eco-design, uh, he has uh, completed uh, the training with acquiring uh, a certain level of knowledge. So that's a, that's a certification for people. And we are also uh, working on another tool, which is an, a, a label, an eco-label, which will help uh, companies that are investing into uh, uh, website eco-design, uh, say to the world and spread spread the message, uh, just putting a small picture on their website and saying my, my website is is eco-friendly. But we don't want to uh, to do greenwashing. So the the whole French community, from customers to uh, web agencies and so on, uh, so the whole community is working today to build this uh, Ecolabel as a really uh, professional grade Ecolabel and avoiding greenwashing. So that's where we are here in France and that's the tools we built and uh, we are now mature enough to share them with uh, the rest of the world and that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. I don't have access to the fancy music and audio, so I can't do the clap, but um, thank you. I do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That was really, that was really great. Um, I, I also do not think I have access to the questions that are being asked. Um, James had to step out for just a minute. So um, in the meantime, I will ask you a quick question, which is um, before, before we um, kick this off, you and I were talking a little bit about effects other than CO2. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Sorry? We were talking a little bit about um, the effects of, of this type of thing other than CO2. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. When, when we, uh, last year we did a, a life cycle assessment and this uh, life cycle assessment, the scope was the uh, worldwide internet. And we tried to understand uh, where uh, all the uh, environmental impacts occurred. And we discovered that uh, uh, there are many kinds of impacts and that they occurred uh, mainly in, uh, in the uh, web user uh, side and not, as everybody said, in the data center. Even if you take the uh, the uh, electricity greenhouse gas mix of uh, USA or other uh, uh, countries, because you know in France we don't have so much uh, CO2 emissions with the, with, uh, with our electricity. So even if you take that into account, um, there are many other kinds of impacts, such as abiotic resource depletion, such as uh, water depletion, and all that kind of, of stuff. I, I'm, if I have enough time, I may share. Um, just for a few minutes, I may try to share it. Uh, I may share just a schema, just for a few seconds. I don't know if you see it. Ah, uh, yep, I can Do see it. Do you see it? Yeah, and because I, I can't see it in, in my laptop. So uh, if you can see it, uh, you have uh, three tiers, so you have the web user tier, you have the network tier, and you have the uh, data center and servers tier. And mainly um, uh, all, all the impacts occurred mainly in the web user side, in fact. 
And that's because that's very simple. And the explanation is very simple. That's because you have s uh, around 6 billion web users and connected objects for 45 million servers. And so you have uh, uh, the proportion is around 200 clients for one server. And you may understand that uh, building and manufacturing the 200 clients or building one server is not the same thing for the environment. And that's, that's, big, that's why uh, when you do lifecycle assessment, uh, all the impacts mainly occurred in the uh, web user uh, side. And that's very important to understand that because you won't work and you won't apply the same best practices uh, when you know that. Uh, as if you believe that everybody happens, uh, sorry, everything happens in the data center. Well, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, so I think I think James is back. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Um, thank you so much again, Fred, for um, telling us about the book and telling us about um, all of your all of the knowledge you have to bring to the table. I really appreciate having you here today. So I'm going to pass it over to James. One last go. Uh, th thank th yes, uh, as John's saying, thank you very much. Um, I, I didn't see any more questions come in, and I'm afraid we are out of our time. In fact, I'm going to get kicked out of the room I'm in, uh, which is unfortunate. So I just wanted to uh, do a final thank you for all of our speakers today. Uh, thank you very much for, for giving your time, and thank you, audience, for, for tuning in, uh, whether you're watching live now or in the months and years to come on YouTube. Um, We'll be sharing out all these URLs again, of course, afterwards, and and to the to the email list. Uh, so I just wanted to close with uh, one quick announcement, which is uh, for for anyone who missed a sustainable uh, UX conference 2016 uh, or who has an appetite for more, we will be holding a U sustainable UX 2017, um, probably in February, date TBD. Uh, I have just posted a survey. Uh, uh, out to past ticket holders about proposed speakers and topics that we could delve into for next year. Uh, if you didn't check out the conference, do check out the YouTube channel, see the kind of talks we had last year, see what you would like to hear more of. I will post that survey to uh, Twitter again. Follow us on Sustainable UX on Twitter um, to uh, see a link to that survey. Uh, then fairly soon we should be posting a, a call for participation form online as well so that people can start submitting uh, their own talk ideas um, uh, for next year. And so we've got a nice nice bit of planning time. Um, we, we, we didn't really market it very much last time. We still got uh, about a thousand cumulative views net right now. We're 400 live on the day and 500 thereafter. Uh, so uh, this year we're hoping to, to sort of gather a bit more momentum and bring this to a larger audience. But again, the event will be free. It will be online on Google Hangouts, uh, the greenest way of doing it that we've found. If anyone knows a, a greener way to do these kinds of live casting, then please let me know. We're always looking for ways to reduce our organizational carbon footprint. Uh, so again, thank you all our speakers today, and uh, particularly to Jen for, uh, 